Hello, it's me, Christine. Welcome to my little crime corner. We are in the city of Conway today, which is a small farming town in South Carolina known for its tobacco. On the evening of November 16th, 1991, a young woman named Crystal Todd was attending her grandmother's birthday party. Crystal was a senior in high school, and the crowd at the party was a different kind of senior. But Crystal loved her grandmother and wouldn't have missed her party. After spending a few hours there, Crystal decided to leave the party sometime around 7 p.m. Crystal drove out of the parking lot and ended up meeting some of her friends at the mall shortly thereafter. After discussing their plans, Crystal and her group of friends decided to go to another party that one of their friends was having, and she stayed there until around 11 p.m. Crystal had to drop one of her friends off at their home and then raced back to the mall parking lot to say goodbye to the rest of her friends as she had to make it home in time for her midnight curfew. A little after 11.30 p.m. that evening, Crystal's mother Bonnie began calling around and called Crystal's friends, asking if they were with Crystal or knew where she might be. The last place anyone had said they saw her was in the mall parking lot. More time had passed, and Crystal still hadn't returned home. When she wasn't home by 1 a.m., Bonnie then called police. After calling police, Bonnie then called Crystal's best friend, a boy named Ken Register, and Ken told Bonnie that he hadn't seen Crystal all night. After getting off the phone with Ken, Bonnie then called her boyfriend and explained the situation and expressed her concern. Her boyfriend immediately got out of bed and headed over to the Todd home to pick up Bonnie. They then proceeded to drive around town looking for Crystal. Eventually, they found Crystal's car in a school parking lot. Crystal was not inside, but her purse and coat were. Bonnie's heart sank, and she felt like someone had taken Crystal. Just a few hours after Crystal's car was found in the parking lot, two hunters in a nearby field discovered what appeared to be a trail of blood. They followed the trail to a ditch, and in the ditch, they found a partially clothed young woman who appeared to have multiple stab wounds. The victim had over 30 cuts and abrasions, as well as several bruises. Her throat had been slashed from ear to ear, and she had been stabbed in a linear pattern down her chest. When police came to examine the scene, they rolled over the young woman to discover that she was still wearing a high school class ring. The motive did not appear to be robbery. When they removed the ring, they found the engraving on the inside revealed the name Crystal Fay Todd. Because of the trail of blood that the hunters initially found, this appeared to confirm that she was killed on the opposite side of the road and dragged and left where she was found. This seemed to do the opposite of concealing the crime scene as the perpetrator, if anything, made it more obvious. It is thought that the killer was possibly panicking and maybe didn't expect what happened or didn't expect to encounter this much blood. It is suspected that this might have been the killer's first victim. This brutal and senseless murder 
shook the town of Conway. It was initially believed that the perpetrator wasn't from the area, but as time went on, investigators weren't so sure. During Crystal's autopsy, the medical examiner found that she had an injury on her left hand, which was consistent with being a defense wound. He found this to be odd, as Crystal was right-handed, and he wondered why she wouldn't have used her right hand to defend herself. This was later discovered to be because she had been stabbed on the left side of her head, which would have paralyzed the right side of her body. Because some of her wounds were found to not have bled, this tells us that they occurred post-mortem, meaning whoever killed her wanted to be absolutely sure that she was dead. Upon examination, it was determined that Crystal had been stabbed more than 31 times. It is apparent that this was overkill. This reinforces the concept that she might have known her attacker since they wanted to be sure that Crystal would not be able to identify them. The medical examiner also determined that Crystal's stab wounds were caused by a three and a half inch knife. Evidence had also shown that she had been sexually assaulted. During police's search for suspects, they started with Crystal's circle of friends. Bonnie had given police some of Crystal's things, including her most recent yearbook. In the yearbook, on the page where everyone signs, police came across the name Andy Tyndall. Andy wasn't a student at the high school, and he really wasn't Crystal's friend. He was more of an acquaintance. Andy Tyndall was a 31-year-old man who was a convicted thief, and at the time was wanted in Alabama for a parole violation. Andy also had a history of pursuing teenage girls. Investigators felt confident that they were on the right track. However, after evaluating Crystal's rape test kit, it was determined that the perpetrator had type O blood, and Andy did not. He was no longer a suspect. A few days later, at Crystal's funeral, her mother Bonnie, as well as the police, once again asked the community if they had any information at all about this horrific crime. Someone did in fact come forward and told police that he actually saw Crystal on the night that she was killed. He said he had driven by the school sometime around midnight and remembers seeing Crystal's car in the parking lot and that there was a man and woman standing beside it. He said that he had gotten a relatively good look at the couple and was able to give a police sketch artist some identifying characteristics. After the sketch was complete, police felt that the couple in the sketch looked familiar. They thought that it looked just like Bonnie and her boyfriend. Bonnie hadn't been a suspect before, but it was looking like she was one now. However, after further questioning of this witness, he revealed that he had been drinking at the bar earlier and said that he actually might have seen Bonnie and her boyfriend on Sunday morning when the two of them had found Crystal's car. The case started slowing down in terms of leads and suspects as Bonnie and Andy had been ruled out. Who could have wanted to hurt Crystal? At the time, it was believed to be someone she knew. Based on how she was found 
and the manner in which she was killed, it is obvious that it was someone who was comfortable getting close enough to stab her, leave her, and get away with it. Police began asking Crystal's male friends and classmates to voluntarily give a DNA sample. Crystal's best friend Ken was among the first few people to have been interviewed by police. While his and many other DNA samples sat backlogged at the state's crime lab, Ken was keeping in touch with Bonnie and was there to support her. Since Crystal's discovery, police had been working 16-hour days, going over the evidence, and had interviewed more than 400 people. Even after all this, they were nowhere closer to solving the case. Although police still didn't have a suspect, they were hoping that the DNA results might yield some clues. In total, 52 of Crystal's friends and acquaintances voluntarily gave a sample. Sure enough, one of the men who had provided a sample actually matched the biologic material found on Crystal's rape test kit. Once they identified the man, they were shocked. The DNA matched that of Ken Register, Crystal's best friend. Bonnie couldn't believe it. She said that she had trusted Ken with Crystal day or night, and in fact, Ken was one of the pallbearers at Crystal's funeral. If you recall, Ken was one of the people that Bonnie had called first on the night that Crystal had gone missing. Crystal and Ken had been best friends since childhood and had never had a romantic relationship. After running a background check on Ken, police had discovered that he had a bad temper and had recently had a police report done on him after he had exposed himself to two female college students. They also learned that several years earlier, when he was 15, he had been caught making several prank phone calls that were very graphic in nature to a woman in town, and she said he had described in detail how he wanted to assault and murder her. Extremely troubling was the fact that he had made these calls in the first place, The way he described his desire to hurt this woman was the same way in which Crystal was killed. When confronted with the fact that his DNA sample matched that of Crystal's killer, Ken was dumbfounded. He went on and on about how he and Crystal had been such good friends for so many years and why on earth would he want to hurt her. He then asked police that if he did do it, why would he have provided police with a sample that would have obviously outed him as the killer? Police were like, I don't know, why would you? In addition to the blood sample, Ken also voluntarily provided saliva and hair samples, as well as fingerprints and a palm print. All they had to go on was the DNA match, which, in my opinion, is exceptionally strong. But after a search of Ken's car had turned up no evidence, he also had an alibi for the night of Crystal's murder. His girlfriend had told police that he had been with her all night at a local go-kart track, and that he had returned to his mother's house shortly after midnight. This was later confirmed by his mother. How could he be in two places at once? Unless he was only in one of these places. Ken's mother was adamant that he was home and she saw him there 
and he didn't leave the home and go anywhere else at any point during the night. Another troubling piece of evidence police got was just about a week and a half before Crystal was killed. Crystal had told her mother that Ken was trying to date her and that he was being very persistent. At the time, Bonnie was like, wow, he must really like you, knowing that he currently had a girlfriend. After being interrogated for six hours, Ken repeatedly told police that he had no involvement or knowledge of Crystal's murder. But near the end of his interrogation, Ken got a note from his mother. The note said something along the lines of, don't say anything until you have a lawyer present. Police then told Ken that his mother had sent a note and that the note said to tell police what happened. If he told the truth, everything would be okay. After hearing that, Ken confessed. He told police how he had seen Crystal that night, sometime around midnight, stopped at a traffic light by the high school. He had convinced her to hang out with him since he didn't have to be home for a while. Crystal then agreed and said, okay, let me just go park my car and I'll come and ride with you. Crystal then got in Ken's car where he then drove to another location and said that they had consensual sex. We know that this most likely was not the case as she had previously told her mother that she wasn't interested in being anything more with him than a friend. He had a girlfriend after all and Crystal wasn't the type to get involved with anyone who was already in a relationship, let alone her very best friend. Forensic evidence confirms that their encounter was not consensual. It is thought that when Crystal had gotten out of Ken's car, Ken had gotten out too to follow her and had grabbed his hunting knife from under the seat. He came up behind her and began stabbing her, eventually killing her. There is evidence that Ken had continued to assault her well after she was killed. It is believed that Ken had deep cleaned his car that same night to get rid of any evidence that Crystal was in his car. Because remember, when police had investigated in his car, they had found nothing. During a subsequent search of Ken's parents' home, where he still lived, police had found Crystal's car keys, as well as several newspaper clippings about her murder. Just before Ken's trial, he had recanted his confession and said it was coerced out of him and he had nothing to do with his best friend Crystal's murder. Investigators knew that he definitely would have had enough time to clean his car and get rid of the murder weapon before police would have suspected him, but couldn't figure out exactly why. He had willingly provided a DNA sample that would lead police directly to him. It was later revealed that when police had asked Ken to provide a DNA sample, Ken reportedly said, what's DNA? So yeah, Ken Register was convicted of first-degree murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault. It took the jury only two hours to reach a guilty verdict. He was sentenced to life in prison, plus 35 years. Ken Register is still currently incarcerated at Broad River Prison in Columbia, South Carolina. He was eligible for parole in February of 2022, 
but had waived his right to a hearing. On September 3rd of 2014, Bonnie had passed away at the age of 79 and is buried next to Crystal in the High Point Baptist Church Cemetery in Conway, South Carolina. This was such a heartbreaking case and a absolute total betrayal from Crystal's so-called best friend. Just devastating for everyone involved. Always keep in touch with your parents, your siblings, your friends, and let people know where you are and who you're with, and just look out for each other. Thank you for sticking with me through this case, and that is all I have for you today. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you learned something, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.